you know, Mark, um, the words that just keep going through my head right now are it's go time, right? And it seems as if everything I've prepared for over the last decade um, or everything I've been doing over the last pe- decade has really prepared me for this moment. Um, you know, in the US, we sort of have this confluence of events, right? This re-emergence and awareness about our racial pandemic. And we have a, an actual pandemic, right? COVID-19 that has um, been particularly um, difficult for communities of color, Black and Latinx communities. Um, and that's in part, it's in part because of the economy and the way, of that, way that's structured, but also because of environmental injustice and their exposure to air pollution, things like that, that have caused those com- comorbidities and you know, made them more vulnerable to the virus. Um, And we have an energy system that is undergoing transformation. And so all of these things, I think, make it even more urgent to engage in an energy transition that is just and brings more clean energy resources to those particularly hard hit communities and those communities where structural violence and structural racism are a fact of daily life. Solanda H. Baker is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Solanda is a professor of law, public policy, and urban affairs at Northeastern University. She has spent more than a decade conducting research on the equity dimensions of the global transition away from fossil fuel energy to cleaner energy resources. She teaches courses on renewable energy development, energy justice, and environmental law. In 2015, she was awarded the Fulbright Garcia Robles Grant to explore Mexico's energy reform, climate change, and indigenous rights. Before joining Northeastern's faculty, Shalanda spent three years as an associate professor of law at William S. Richardson School of Law, University of Hawaii where she was the founding director of the Energy Justice Program. Prior to that, she served on the faculty at the University of San Francisco School of Law. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Political Science from the United States Air Force Academy, a Juris Doctorate from Northeastern University School of Law, and an LLM from the University of Wisconsin School of Law, where she also served as a William H. Hasty Fellow. Immediately after law school, before working as a corporate and project finance attorney in both the Boston and Tokyo offices of the law firm of Bingham McCutcheon, Shalanda clerked for Associate Justice Roderick Ireland of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Shalanda, also a veteran of an former Air Force officer fought to end the military's don't ask, don't tell policy. She is the author of over a dozen articles, books, chapters, and essays on renewable energy law, policy, and development. She is the co-founder and co-director of the Initiative for Energy Justice, an organization committed to providing technical law and policy support to communities on the front lines of climate change. She also serves on the Massachusetts Energy Facilities Sitting Board, the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act Implementation Advisory Committee, Climate Justice Working Group, the Board of Solutions Project, the Board of Clean Energy Group, and the Board of Solstice Solar. (laughs) Her book, Revolutionary Power, An Activist Guide to the Energy Transition, will be out publicly January 14th. I was lucky enough to get a digital pre-copy and I hot off the press copy here, Revolutionary Power. I read it end to end, digitally and physically, and I'm so glad to welcome Shalanda on the show. Welcome, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That was a lovely and long introduction. (laughs) So I have to live up to all of that, but um, it's delightful to be here with you. You will absolutely live up to it. And actually, that was a shortened version because you have been doing this for a long time. You deserve the accolades and you you not only done the hard work and, and put in the time and spent the effort, but uh, 
this book is so fabulous. I love it. Thank it's you. amazing because it's not a dry academic read. It's, it's a story. It's a story of your life. It's a story of your journeys. Uh, a, a lot of it based in Hawaii and the injustices there. And, and it just tells so, such a nice journey and how and why um, even, even your, uh, how, how do I put it? Your hesitance to sometimes say, should I get into this topic? Should I broach social injustice with energy rights and, and changes in renewable energy and these inequalities? Should I combine the two and say how they're linked together? Uh, yeah. and, and we'll get into that more, but before I go too deep down some rabbit holes, I really want to uh, say, how in the hell have you weathered this absolutely crazy time, you know, yeah. more than you know, uh, mm. 2020, of course, now also going into 2021, not, not only social injustices, uh, a lot of uh, uh, racial problems uh, going on, as well as climate and uh, pandemic issues. How, mm. how has all of this past your history given you resilience to weather the storm? Have you been prepared? Mm. You know, Mark, um the words that just keep going through my head right now are it's go time, right? And it seems as if everything I've prepared for over the last decade um, or everything I've been doing over the last decade has really prepared me for this moment. Um, you know, in the US, we sort of have this confluence of events, right? This re-emergence and awareness about our racial pandemic. And we have a, an actual pandemic, right? COVID-19 that has um, been particularly um, difficult for communities of color, Black and Latinx communities. Um, and that's in part, it's in part because of the economy and the way of that way that's structured, but also because of environmental injustice and their exposure to air pollution, things like that, that have caused those com comorbidities and, you know, made them more vulnerable to the virus. Um, and we have an energy system that is undergoing transformation. And so all of these things, I think, make it even more urgent to engage in an energy transition that is just and brings more clean energy resources to those particularly hard hit communities and those communities where structural violence and structural racism are a fact of daily life. Yes, that's absolutely true. And I mean, do did, did all this past, uh, not only Hawaii, but even mm -hmm. before that and, and now and in Boston uh, and, and your work with energy and also Mexico, um, mm -hmm. did any of that, you personally, give you some resilience or, or some foreshadowing, so to say, boy, this is coming. The infrastructure is not stable. The way things are set up is very unequal. There's some issues and uh, eventually it's gonna bubble to the surface. I mean, uh, we, we'll get into this a little bit later, but there was a section in the book about uh, uh, Hurricane Xavier and Hawaii and, and the devastations that that included. And, and as a climate speaker, we can, we can kind of go in how and why and, and, and some of those things. But did, did you have any resilience or were you also caught off guard or does, does this knowledge, all this past knowledge and the things you've been working on and trying to fight the inequalities and the social justice in this energy sector um, has that given you resilience to say, okay, we're going to be okay. We can weather this. There are some better operating systems, some models. I kind of want an update and see how, how you've been, how, how you've dealt with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in many ways, I think this moment actually, it's horrible. It's terrible, but it provides this window. It provides this opportunity and, you know, to create this transformative change. And I think, as I've been doing this work, um, I, I wasn't ever sort of thinking something bad is going to happen. I mean, other than climate change, I mean, climate is is devastating yeah, and will be yeah. even more disruptive than what we're experiencing right now. But I had this sense that um, nothing will really change unless there is a disruptive moment. And so um, it's sort of like, you know, along the journey, I've been collecting my tools, collecting my tools, kind of waiting for the perfect opportunity to really advance um, some of these ideas. Um, yes, I'm tired. So, I mean, I think you're, the root of your question is sort of, you know, how do we think about resilience? And I'm tired, but also so uplifted in a way by the opportunity 
Um, and, you know, I, I take breaks uh, here and there and my, my students also, you know, they get discouraged because they, they're sort of watching all of this negativity and, you know, the world fall apart. And, you know, I tell them, okay, take your break, but this is your moment as well to kind of create the world that you believe in, um, the future that you want. Um, so I couldn't have predicted this moment. I don't think any of us really could have, but I knew that nothing would change without disruption. Um, and, you know, when I was in Hawaii, and I know we're going to talk about that, you know, one of the things I would always tell my students was to dream about a world and dream of a world without constraints. Because we were, you know, they were law students. And so they were very familiar with the rules and sort of the boxes that we had to fit in. And I said, let's, let's dissolve those. And let's just imagine what the world might look like if, if we didn't have these sort of constraints that are already baked into the system. So now here we are. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I, I'd like to hear from you, but I, I, I imagine um, as I read your book and, and I hear about your journey that a, a lot of your transition in the ways of thinking, your ways of teaching, things that you write in the book are not truly conventional that you would receive at law school. I, I mean, I've been to law <laughs> school myself and, and they're not conventional wisdom and, and learnings that you receive. Um, to kind of broach the subjects of social injustice. And uh, I imagine you're also uh, enabling your students with some empowering tools to help them through situations like this, which then provides them with resilience, not mm -hmm. only for themselves, but for those who they work for and, and the projects they work on to, to have resilience and see the brighter day. How do, we, how do we make it through this pandemic? How do we make it through these unrestful situations uh, mm. uh, that we're experiencing now? Uh, is, is that the case? Are you, are you seeing that you're busier than ever now because you're like, wow, this microscope is shining, things are bubbling to the surface and I'm, I'm prepared, I'm ready. Now I can help my students and people with the solutions on the way we should be thinking differently to solve these problems. I mean, I'm getting chills as you're speaking because this has been the most incredible, the busiest, you know, the most productive time, I think, of my career. Um, you know, I think starting in May post, um, well, just as the pandemic was kind of really becoming devastating here in the United States, but also after the death and the murder, um, the public lynching of George Floyd, that sort of sparked, you know, all of the sort of connections. I mean, it's sort of like people, the light bulbs went off and people sort of realized, oh my gosh, there are all these connections and, you know, between racial violence, this pandemic, structural inequality uh, and and the energy system. And so, yes, I've been, I've been um, quite busy of late um, and, you know, it's so interesting because I have been against the grain for the bulk of my career, really saying that, um, you know, issues of justice are, should be a part of this technical conversation concerning energy and, and climate. But those were sort of always thought of um, as things we will deal with later, right? We'll, we'll sort of build the whole, the plane and then figure out, you know, where to seat the, you know, people of color and <laughs> indigenous folks. So, um, but that's always been central to my work. And, you know, one of the things I, I come out with in the book is, is who I am, right? I'm a woman, I'm a queer woman. I'm, I've, I've had an interesting journey and um, it's sort of like the New York saying, you know, if you see something, say something. I can't, I, I only see injustice because of the path that I've walked. Um, and so that's kind of been the way that I've approached this work, highlighting injustice, highlighting structural inequality because it's my unique superpower um, on the planet, I think. You, you have many superpowers and in, in your book, you, you, yeah, you, you talk about COVID. So it's a very timely, timely uh, uh, book as well. The timing of all of this is, is extraordinary. I mean, this is a moment when also our national leaders are realizing that we need to um, move in a direction of centering issues of equity. And so I'm excited to support that team in whatever way makes sense. And, you know, I've been working on the ground through my organization, the Initiative for Energy Justice, to help develop equitable um, energy policy frameworks as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I really uh, appreciate you getting us up to speed on kind of this transition and what you've experienced. And it leads me to my first question is probably that, <clears throat> Uh, I see you take a big focus on, on the U.S., obviously, because that's where you're mm -hmm. from. You've done a lot in Hawaii, Mexico, and, 
uh, as well as so, so North America and, and uh, Boston and, and that, but you've worked uh, with uh, cities like Texas or in states like Texas and, and, and many others that are discussed in the book. But how would you feel about being a global citizen and how do you view or think about a world in the future one without nations, borders, divisions of humanity, one from another, one that has a revolutionary mm -hmm. renewable power grid that is global. Wow, that is a fascinating concept. I mean, I absolutely, you know, see myself as a global citizen. Um, I'm not as aligned with the tribal kind of affiliations and alliances that have come even more stark in the United States of late. Um, you know, I think we we have to work together um, no matter what to, to, to resolve this climate crisis. And if that means a grid that is, um, you know, stretched across continents, then so be it. Um, I tend to be more of the mind that we need decentralized grids. And of course, you know, I think there's a place for there is a place for the larger grid, but in terms of resilience and making sure that people can bounce back from the climate emergencies that are, you know, are absolutely in our future, we do need more local um, just distributed energy, particularly in the homes that are um, you know, not equipped to sort of go back, go out and buy you know, groceries once they're spoil or get new medicines once theirs go bad um, or be off of ventilators and other types of you know, um, medical devices when the power goes down. So we, we absolutely need a distributed grid. Um, but I, but I'm intrigued by the idea of, um, you know, this, this more global grid. Um, and of course the, the legal brain in me is working. I'm like, so how would you govern that? You know, what are the governance mechanisms? I'd love to learn more about what you have in mind. Yeah, I, th I think that's interesting because in your book, you really talk about what, what's the on the ground realities uh, politically and also making putting some of these things in into practice because there there's a lot of uh, uh, issues that uh, that arise even on a state level um, um, that, that are from state to state very, very different. Um, and your energy and your meaningful energy justice work. So President-elect mm -hmm. Biden made a promise mm -hmm. to commit and devote 40% of climate investments to frontline communities. Yes. Well, those investments really need to be in infrastructure and the basic needs. And you talk about basic needs a lot in, in your your book. You might not say basic needs, but it's the basics, well, clean water, energy, you know, um, uh, we need to uh, tackle these. And those that we're seeing all around the world who are facing not only uh, social injustice, but are who are affected by climate change first, are those who have the worst infrastructures, those are the poorest communities, they're the ones of uh, in, indigenous populations of color um, who, uh, even in the Bronx, in, in, in New York, in, in the Bronx, you know, those poorest uh, communities, the poor schools, the ones that are hardest hit because they don't have that infrastructure, they don't have the basic needs. That's right. Uh, and you really address that. How do right. we flip the switch and, and do it differently? And so that's kind of why yeah. I, I touched upon that because I want to bring out more your thoughts, your feelings on, on what that you talk about in the book, on what direction we should take, how can we make it a more unified uh, plan that works for everybody, a system that's really well thought out and, and covers the basic needs for everyone. Yeah, um, I love that you mentioned this and I like this, the, the framing that you've offered. So I, I first wanna say that the type of circumstances that people in places like the South Bronx um, are living within on a day-to-day -day basis are not accidental, right? These are structural. And these are problems that were um, created and constructed by law and policy choices. And so we are almost, I mean, I would argue we have sort of this blank slate where we can construct a new reality um, and construct and make different choices that that um, elevate the needs of, of those particular communities. Um, and so I think 
my vision is to put them at the front of the line um, in terms of receiving any of the economic benefits. Um, and, and so the 40% commitment that President-elect Biden has made is, is a great start. Um, but, but that means reducing their energy burden. So these are the same communities that pay upwards of 10, 20, 25, 30% of overall income just to meet energy needs, which is mind blowing. And it's to subsidize an energy system that is in effect killing them because it is a fossil fuel based one. So they're subsidizing it not only with their pocketbooks but with their bodies. And so these are policy choices. So I think we need to reduce energy burden. Um, and we do that, we can do that through policy levers. Um, we can also do that by investing solar resources in those communities. So, you know, there's, there's no reason why a family can't have, you know, solar that is powering a clean grid and it's also reducing their, um, their own energy burden. Um, now we haven't been able to figure that out, right? The low hanging fruit for solar, particularly rooftop solar was, you know, the sort of middle-class, you know, more affluent folks. Um, and now we need to go to, you know, the, those who have been left behind, um, just as we're hitting the grid limits around rooftop solar. So we need to innovate, we need to figure that out. And I think we can. Um, I think we also need to find pathways for people to participate in solar through things like community solar. So I know you're in Germany um, and community energy is sort of a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, you know, community ownership of things like large wind are, is a no brainer. Um, community ownership of solar. Yeah, sure, let's figure it out. We have the mechanisms. So in the US, we need to sort of get free of all these constraints that we've you know, um, constructed for ourselves where we assume that communities should not be participants in this transition. And I mean, economic participants, not just, oh yes, okay, we'll get the, you know, the whatever the community benefit is, if it's you know, a donation to our local soccer team or whatever, I'm talking about real benefits. Um, and you know, we need to, I don't fight the bad. So there are two types of, you know, sort of advocates in this space. One is kind of the environmental justice advocate. They're fighting the bad. They have been doing that for 30 years and I'm aligned with them and my work overlaps with them, but I'm about sort of making sure that the good is not replicating the inequalities that we see in the bad system. And so, um, so I'm, I'm encouraged. The last thing I'll say is, well, two things, um, one, we need to make sure that people have access to credit and finance um, in order to actually get some of this clean energy infrastructure in their communities and we can innovate. There are different banking models that can allow for that. Um, and then the second thing is some of this equity discussion has to start at the top. So we have states in the United States that are sort of experimenting with um, you know, 100% clean energy uh, laws and policies and we need to make sure that equity like President-elect Biden's plan, equity is central to, to that transition. So that's my soapbox um, <laughs> on all well, of my you vision. You get on so many soapboxes. That's <laughs> fine. That's what our platform is for. I really want great. that all to come out. And, and it, it's really great because you touched on credit and that was really where I wanted to go a little bit deeper. I'm, I want you to ex explain it um, a little bit more for us because sure. I think it is absolutely asinine that we need to get credit for a basic need. You know, uh, we should be getting credit if we want to uh, buy a car or something extravagant or something something extra to improve the the our livelihoods. But for basic needs, water, utilities, power, uh, we shouldn't be needing a credit to get those. That's my personal opinion, and I and I don't yeah. mind bringing it in. But I, you know, to hear to hear you talk about that, I want you to tell me some of the struggles, what your thoughts are, and, and I, what you mean by that exactly. Sure. So these solar assets are not cheap, and you know, for folks to participate, they either need to have the money in the bank. Um, so that means they have wealth, right? Um, and they can just kind of dip into that and purchase it, or they go and get a loan um, from the bank and finance it through that, or 
they work with a third party solar developer who finances it themselves and charges the customer, you know, kind of a monthly rate for um, the assets. And so um, because of the model, we already know who's going to be excluded, right? Um, yeah. Historical patterns of racism, redlining, all those things make access to credit a problem in communities of color. Um, it makes, um, you know, the wealth creation a problem, right? People of color have less wealth than, than white people in this country. And we, I mean, there was a study here in Boston that showed that I think the average white family has something like $100,000 worth of wealth. And here the black family has $18 or something ridiculous. Like it's some <laughs> wild disparity. It, it's, it's ridiculous. So, so wealth is not something that communities of color have. Um, and, you know, with respect to the third party model where the developer comes around and knocks on doors, they're going to where they perceive there to be low hanging fruit. And so the solar industry, um, you know, studies have come out showing that the solar industry is just not diverse. And so um, there are majority white workers going into majority white communities to say, hey, we want to sell our product. And, you know, the pressure of sales and all of that, the model means that um, they're going to go to the communities where there's just an easier entry. So that's why communities of color have been left behind. Um, and so we either need to fix that um, solar access problem through the utility bill. And I think that's sort of one, one thing that you're alluding to, right? This is a basic human right. Um, you know, one of the other studies um, out there shows that community people pay their electricity bills like that's one of the first things they pay um, and so if if the utility company could kind of sit with that debt and that maybe could be guaranteed by another government entity right and they're financing this debt for solar over time then that would help um, communities of color get more access um, if we could create a new banking model where this, the traditional markers of sort of credit worthiness are, you know, put aside, and you know, it's more of have you been paying your electricity bill instead of do you have an 800s credit score? Um, you know, those are the types of innovations we need desperately right now, and we are going to need government intervention um, to support those types of innovations. Yeah, I, re I remember uh, it was probably more than six years ago now when. Uh when there used to be door-to-door -door salesmen going around selling solar panels for your home and, yeah. and things like this. And then um, Tesla, uh, Solar City, uh, to, uh, Elon's uh, cousins, I guess, uh, relatives <laughs> got, got into the market as well. And they kind of flipped the switch on the model where they were kind of um, giving loans and, and kind of giving credit to certain people, but they, they also continued to own the product and they would get monies back. And there was kind of a win-win situation on that utility. Um, yep. But I also believe that there are some big disparities of what neighborhoods or what places they were going to sell those, but there are innovative models out there and there's more and more emerging all the time that how can we make this something for everyone? How can we make this something that uh, gives us more microgrids and more, um, availability of this these type of services in the worst areas in the south bronx and in, in the rougher communities where where the uh, there's big poverty level or uh um you know um well in germany they call it uh and i'm trying to think of the word in english now so it's uh, <laughs> So uh, the projects basically in, in places where they really need this the most, you know, where mm -hmm. they're really struggling day to day. Um, right, right. I mean, the question, the central question that I ask in my work is how can this transition be used to transform society? How can it be used to, you know, create economic empowerment to be a gateway for civil rights and, um, I think one one way I've I've started to talk about this whole issue is if we are simply putting our clean energy transition on top of an infected system, one that is infected with structural racism and inequality, then that new system will itself be unequal, right? And, yeah. and infected in the same way. And so um, we have to create a new model, an underlying model. And put that and put the clean energy transition on top of that so that we can be more just. So um, 
So yeah, um, I agree. I mean, we should be prioritizing communities in under-resourced neighborhoods, which again, I'll just say, are neighborhoods that were designed by choice, yeah. right? And designed mm -hmm. by deliberate policy uh, and, and law choices. Yeah, and I see that around the world, a lot of our, our um, neighborhoods, a lot of our communities, they're really outdated. They're, they're infrastructures that need to be overhauled, updated to this renewable um, transition that we need to make this new, some more passive homes, more homes mm -hmm. and, and, and buildings run on renewable energy with green roofs and, and on and on. Yes. Um, to, to keep Love up it. with yeah the future of our infrastructure and, and we're we're paying more and we're running into more problems but we're not getting a better service and we're we're still like you said a lot of these poor communities are are uh, really paying with their their own lives they're on doing fossil fuels they're living in really bad air pollution bad areas that is only uh exacerbating the problem even more yeah. Yeah. um and, yeah. and they're at more risk uh, yeah. right now to COVID-19 because they're deemed essential workers, right? Many of them are in the, in the very jobs that are low paying, but that put them in harm's way routinely. So not only are they kind of entering into that higher risk environment with these underlying conditions or other things that make them more vulnerable to this disease, but they're having to go out and, and work, um, you know, simply because of their economic vulnerability. And so it's just, there's, there's a lot here um, to unpack and a lot of connections. I think. Yeah, there is tons to unpack. I mean, that's also some of the ties you, you made. And I totally agree with you as, you know, um, those conditions really are not good conditions to, to, uh, uh, try not to get the COVID or try to get, uh, uh, you know, affected because not only, even if you're at high risk, your environment, right. the air pollution, the type of energy in your area is also a factor that increases your chances of getting, of getting that. And so uh, it's really a systemic problem that we need to fix a real root cause. Um, I, I guess I, I wanna really start out now with your definition if you could define the phrase revolutionary power, what you mean by that, what the concept is, that, that would be great. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I have struggled to kind of come up with a succinct definition of it. Um, but the one that I've been landing on, and I think people will come up with their own definitions, actually, that's one of the, the hopes I have for the book. Um, but it's, it's centering the voices, the hopes, the dreams of those who are most impacted by the energy system um, in this energy transition. And so that's, that doesn't sound radical to someone like me who's been in this space for a little while, but it is absolutely radical um, in terms of the way that we approach energy policy today. Um, and it's using, revolutionary power is using the energy system as a vehicle um, to advance civil rights um, and social change. So that's, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, that, that's perfect. Back. And I, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to give too big of a spoiler alert, but oh, you okay. also, you also alluded to it as well. Uh, at the very end of the book, you said, you know, mm -hmm. take these stories, these messages that I've given you, this empowerment of the tools, the, the big picture of, of these systems, these, uh, these grids, our energy situation where we're at, and make the stories your own, add to them, mm -hmm. make them personal to where you're living, whether it's the Bronx, whether it's Hamburg, Germany, whether wherever, and, 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 and connect the dots, and then tell your story, but spread the word mm -hmm. and, and, and empower yourself to, to join in this revolution. It's really a revolution mm -hmm. for a better future. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you, you um, honestly, one of the things I was so excited about when I knew we were going to have our, our discussion is um, you empower women and girls, you uh, uh, exude diversity, you exude, uh, you know, um, gender equality in your beliefs and basic rights, uh, social rights uh, for, for humanity that you, mm -hmm. You, you want it for all, you teach about it, you empower people. And so I'm so excited because I can see that 
throughout your book with the tools on on through stories. I mean, that's what story is, is empowerment and tools to to move forward on, on how you can use that in a very positive way, you know, not uh, uh, there's very ne not not I don't see negativity or anything, you know, um, the type of revolutionary words oh, right. that we would use in any way. So it's a very positive movement and, and I'm with you. So I'm oh. totally with you. Thank you so much. I, I want to um, maybe if you could tell us a little bit more if there was a specific moment or time mm -hmm. where um, the social disjustice, um, specifically in the energy, but in other areas, where it kind of bubbled to the surface for you and you said, mm -hmm. I, I can't continue. I, yeah. I've got to say something. I've got to change. I've got to be that voice. I've got to, the, now's the time. Uh, was there mm -hmm. a moment or was it a transition or journey over time? Oh my gosh, there's so much that you've just shared that is resonating on such a deep level. And I just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, you're moving words. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, this journey really started in Mexico. Um, I used to be a corporate lawyer. And um, so way back in 2008, during President Obama's electoral season and during the financial crisis of the global financial crisis of that year, I found myself in, in Japan. And um, I was a, a young lawyer working in Japan, sort of head down, the world was falling apart. It was the hottest year on record. We just elected our first black president and there was such hope about what might be next. Um, but I, as a lawyer, I was sort of helping to reconstruct an unequal system and, you know, and again, financial system. Um, our clients were sort of trying to preserve wealth. And meanwhile, my family was underemployed or unemployed in the United States. And I was, it was just this moment of great dissonance. And um, I would say for me, living in Tokyo during that time, so I lived there 2008, 2009, was the wake up call. And then um, I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico. And I bought that ticket, um, not really sure where I was headed or what was gonna happen, but I wanted to learn Spanish. I maybe wanted to work um, against fossil fuel companies in Latin America, didn't know where. It was very naive and I was old enough to know better. Um, but during that time, I actually met indigenous people who were fighting against large scale wind development. And that was the moment where I realized that everything I had learned up until that point could be used in service of social justice. And it was sort of like that, you know, lightning bolt moment that kind of strikes you. And at that point I knew I couldn't turn away. And so the indigenous peoples were fighting against wind in the same way that we see communities fighting against coal and oil and gas, the same companies or the same sort of types of companies were going in, dispossessing them, dividing their neighbors. People were getting killed over clean energy. Um, and the environmental harms were devastating. I mean, it was, de it was you know, messing with the water table. Um, you know, they couldn't farm in the same traditional ways. And it wasn't just one wind project, right? I mean, that we can countenance. One wind project for a community that's, you know, it's supplying that community. These were mega projects, some of the largest wind energy projects in the world. And now that place, Oaxaca, has the highest density of onshore wind of any place in the world. But I got there just as that was getting off the ground. And I think the people there realized that they were a part of this essentially neo-colonial moment, right? That they were going to be subject to this devastation. If their lives have changed, they're over 2,200 megawatts of energy in this small place called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, and the energy does not even flow into their homes, which is the most devastating, one of the most devastating aspects of the story for them. And so I got there at the beginning and my career, my academic career really started with telling that story through the sort of traditional academic way I became an expert on indigenous rights and wind and finance. Um, and during my time in Hawaii, I saw the similar, something similar playing out where the, the most marginalized communities in Hawaii were sort of being 
sought after as the location, the home for this new development without receiving any of the benefits. And these are the same communities that were paying a lot more for electricity. I mean, Hawaii is ridiculous in terms of how much people pay. Um, but but I, I saw a real opportunity for them to benefit from the, that state's transition. And so, you know, your question was, when did I, um, how, was, when did it I- It sounds like it was a, a journey over time. It wasn't like a lightning strike, but it was more and more, you were seeing things where you're like, oh, this is injustice. This is not right. right. And Yeah. And there were multiple inflection points. And then it wasn't until I really left Hawaii that I thought, I have something to say here. And, you know, I know you get a lot of authors on your show and they talk about the writing process, I'm sure. And for me, I mean, I had written, so I, I had the opportunity to go back to Mexico 10 years after my initial time to go as a Fulbright scholar and study how energy, the energy transition, you know, was continuing to unfold. And I spent a lot of time in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is gorgeous and lovely and Mayan country and just oh, so rich culturally and great activists and communities there. Um, and I thought my book was, and so I wrote a book proposal when I was on my Fulbright and I said, this is the book I'm gonna write. And I got back to the United States and I don't know why, but something said, it was just sort of serendipitous. Someone introduced me to Island Press, my publisher. And they said, I think she's writing a book. And, and so they, they reached out and said, oh, are you writing a book? And I said, yeah, but the book that came out was really this domestic story. It wasn't about Mexico. And you asked me about sort of being an outlier in the academy. Um, the Mexico book would have been very doctrinal, very legalistic, very, you know, standard kind of legal book. This book that wanted to come out is deeply personal. And, and I'm sort of getting emotional about it because it is the one that sort of pushed through me and pushed through my typing. And my dad was with me because my, my father passed away and he had a story to, to tell in this book. Um, you know, my mom, my family, like there were stories that needed to be told. And this is the one that came out very quickly. And so it turns out that it's, it's a book for this moment. Um, and I don't own it. I'm grateful to be the conduit for that story. I, I can't take credit for what I experienced. Um, I'm just the vessel to disseminate um, those lessons. And so it is with humility that I present the work um, to the world. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any specific stories about social mm -hmm. injustice, this justice that mm -hmm. uh, specific towards the energy sector that maybe the most of us are in the dark about that uh, would be good to, to know and hear about um, that you would like to touch upon? Sure. I mean, you know, I think I do want to uplift the Mexico story um, because it is one that is devastating. Um, you know, we think about plunder of a place in the oil and gas and coal context. But Mexico is very much an exemplar of what happens when you do clean energy development using the same logics of fossil fuel development. So extractive, um, large footprint, you know, not paying attention to social and environmental rights. And we have indigenous communities in Oaxaca who are continuing to fight for their humanity um, in the clean energy transition. And, and I think the, the that's the point I really want to make there is that clean energy, again, can replicate inequality if we're not careful. Um, I think there's an injustice going on right now um, in the United States um, regarding COVID. And so we have folks who are underemployed or unemployed due to this ongoing financial crisis um, that had they had nothing to do with. And there were all sorts of policies and, and um, essentially policies and orders that were adopted throughout the summer saying we can't disconnect these folks from electricity um, because you know there's this financial shock and we want to we have an, um, a state of emergency and so there was protection in general throughout the summer and early fall and now those protections have been lifted and so what that means is people can be shut off from electricity so we think about the sort of human needs the basic needs that we were talking about earlier we think about housing we think about water access but 
electricity is often not a part of that. Um, the fact that so many people are being disconnected or have the threat of being disconnected from electricity during a time when everyone's being asked to go inside and shelter in place, during a time when children are being asked to use computers and other electrical devices to educate themselves, to me is a human rights violation. Um, and so that's going on right now where folks are with facing those threats. And then on the back end, we don't know what the economy is gonna look like in March or April or May. Are these people gonna be able to go back to any sort of jobs um, or you know, will they continue to flounder? I mean, I'm hoping that this new administration and the Congress will create real economic benefits for these folks, um, but they're gonna be facing back payments because of all the, they're called the rearages. Um, they're gonna be facing those due to the lapses in, in, in their financial, um, financial flow um, in the last several months. So that's an emergency um, that I would say that is invisible because it's not being kicked out of your home. It's being, it's sitting in your home in the dark. It is. So you, you uh, we, I don't even want to talk too much or, or uh, broach the Oompa Loompa, but um, mm. <laughs> as, as there's pardons going on uh, mm. or, or discussions of that, I really think uh, uh, our, President-elect Biden, when he gets in office, not only should should fix um, <clears throat> the the U.S. electoral system, but also um, that there should be some pardons made immediately of all those people affected during the pandemic. Not a stimulus check. I mean, that's fine, and that's another debate. But some pardons upon basic needs, rights, electricity, yeah. utilities, and those things that people aren't left in. You know, we. Uh, Obama talked about uh, college debt and, and things like that. Uh, uh, Biden's talked about college debt. This is another form of, of life debt. It's a basic needs, basic rights, um, and uh, uh, dealt with it in many different ways during the, the beginning of the pandemic. Parents were all of a sudden becoming teachers. They were trying to get their kids enough computers and educate them at home and, and uh, their domestic violence was on the rise and they were trying to now, now that they went from a parent to also being a school teacher and educator, finding enough mm. computers and what, whatever, um, mm. the infrastructure wasn't there for this type of uh, new, yeah, this new view of our human zoos and at, in 24 seven where every family member or person is now in, in the space and you get this microscopic view of what that infrastructure looks like is there enough space is there enough energy is there enough uh, computers is there enough internet is on and on uh, well, of it, what to do yeah it's just mind-boggling the assumptions that were built into the policy responses to covid right the policy i mean the assumptions were okay we're going to shelter in place we're going to shut everything down but that means some people are still working some people can't shelter in place. Some people, you know, live in homes that have multi-generations with vulnerable people in them. Um, you know, not everyone has a computer, as you said. So the policy responses were built for the affluent middle-class American, right? So those folks were taken care of. And then we didn't create a safety net, right? I mean, in, in other places around the world, there's enough of a social safety net so people weren't having to make difficult decisions. You think my grocery store checker wants to be there working? Is taking pride in being a frontline worker? That person wants to be home. And what if they have kids? Who's taking care of those kids? Because those kids can't go to school. Yep. So, I mean, our policy responses were completely misguided um, with assumptions baked in con concerning, you know, what types of resources people had at their disposal. So, yeah, yeah. I'm... I'm, I'm multifaceted, I'm, crazy thing. There's a, there's a lot more we have to do going forward. And I'm, I absolutely, we do not want to return to business as usual as the World That's Economic not. Forum has said, you know, the great reset. And uh, uh, as one way to put it, we, we definitely need to create some new systems and fix those ones that have come bubbling to the surface that we've really seen um, microscope on uh, last year and the beginning of this year as well. Uh, we need to fix those, and uh, because it just doesn't affect us. I'm in Hamburg, Germany, but uh, you know my heart's in the U.S. as as well, and I I uh, feel and uh, feel for the 
the things you guys are going through and, and uh, feel and see that as well. And so yeah. the, I, that's another reason I really like that. It's a very timely book and it addresses those things in the book. And I'm going to ask you my hardest question that I have for you today. Okay. Uh, so Hopefully I can uh, answer it. We'll see if you start sweating. No, it's not that, it's not that bad. It's the, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although many people have been asking themselves that and pulling out their hair uh, th this year. It's actually, what's the future? Oh, love it. It's what's the future? And, and I want to know for you, uh, you know, what, what's your vision? What's yeah. your future? What's the future? Yeah. There is a, a capital F and a little f, right? There's sort of the big F future. And the little f for me is it's going to be a dark time for the next, I would say, two years at least, um, maybe, maybe more, um, as we reckon with ourselves in this country and our role in creating global, the global climate crisis. Um, and I think the next two years are, are going to be a time of dealing with who we are and, and looking at ourselves in the mirror and also understanding those connections, you know, the structural violence, our imperial appetite, our, um, cons our appetite for consumption, the, just the systems that we have erected on top of a, a very infected social structure. We are going to be reckoning with that. And you could see it in the last Wednesday's um, insurrection where there was initially a shock, but then things sort of sort of, sort of settled into their, their usual places. But there were even some in the middle who didn't know whether they were gonna go on the side of racial justice or go with the sort of status quo and say, we need to move on. Um, so I think we'll see more and more moments. I mean, I'm, I'm sad to say that, but we are in a moment of, incredible unrest and instability in this country. And I think until we reckon with who we are, that's our future, little f. Um, but the big F is that light will prevail and that we will end up in a place of justice. And this is sort of some of the concepts I was playing with in the, in the last chapter, which was very much a fictional account of what I think might happen. Um, climate change is here, it's going to be devastating. It is already um, underway. The, the justice that we're fighting for on climate is for future generations. We are amidst um, a, a transition in terms of climate. That's un undisputable. And I think the science is there on that. Um, but we have an opportunity to really create an energy system that allows us to be more resilient in the face of that. And so the, the, the capital F I think is one where we have reckoned with ourselves in terms of the social injustice and the racial injustice um, that exists. And we've created a world where everyone has access to those basic rights that you talked about, Mark, um, uh, including energy, including water, including internet, you know? Uh, and, and so I'm looking, I'm working toward that future. Um, and I, I am not cynical enough to believe that it's not possible. I think, I think it's something that we can do. You got the answer right. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I've never had the same answer uh, twice. And uh, yours was very beautiful. Thank you uh, for that. It, it's so important that we, we think about that question, what's the future? Mm -hmm. Because if we don't know what the future is, that means we don't have a plan, which means we'll never reach it. It's just like a, a, a map or a compass on a ship or a boat or, or an airplane or whatever. If you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. And so we need to have right. some form of plans. And there's some global plans out there. You know, one is the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, the, mm -hmm. the, the Green New Deal, the New Deal. Um, you know, there's there's many out there that we, we've heard about, uh, or maybe not many, uh, Mm -hmm. less than a handful um but unless we know about them unless we're working towards them we're never going to achieve it we're going to wait for um someone to deliver the future to us and i think right. we will be sorely disappointed if we're waiting for some of the crazy leaders we have today to deliver those futures to us or even even others will we, we'll be disappointed uh we need to 
realize we're on this spaceship Earth. We're all crew members. None of us are passengers. I mean, there's really only two points in life when you're a baby or you're uh, extremely elderly where you become a passenger. The most of the time you are able to grab the steering wheel and be a crew member to guide your direction, the Earth's direction of where we want to go in the future. Um, yes, I, I, I love that. <laughs> I, yeah, I really, um, like I said, I, I really love your book and I love the way you talk about it, the stories, the journey you take us on. And even though, you know, said at the end is a little bit um, your vision of the future, what you would, your, your best case scenario or what you would hope and wish for. Um, but, I, but I believe it's, it's very achievable. It's very doable for us. I, I want to get some clarification on three other little points that you make in the, in the book. And there are also some, some uh, I guess, teasers or ho hopefully not spoilers, um, but it'll move people to read the book. Um, tell me about solar segregation and what you mean mm. about energy segregation, exactly mm. what that means. And maybe there's not just one definition. There's a couple of instances where you've seen that. And I think mm -hmm. they've been different. Can you tell yeah. us a little more about that? Sure. So, you know, that concept really connects back to our earlier discussion around how the solar industry has sort of um, targeted, whether that's directly or indirectly, you know, certain communities for solar development uh, and, and left others behind. Um, and we now have several studies showing that communities of color simply have less access to solar. And so it's a provocative term um, because we know what segregation is, but we don't think about that in the context of solar. Um, but we absolutely have a disparity in terms of access to rooftops, top solar and black and brown communities in this country simply don't have the same access. So, so that's really what I meant um, by solar segregation. And it's one I actually heard Seth Spears, who's the founder of Solstice Solar and out of Cambridge, Massachusetts um, use in a talk. And I said, oh, I use that in my book. And so, you know, we're friends, but I think that's it's great. a concept that resonates um, in terms of its construct. Yeah, so uh, there, there is, some change on the horizon. There are some things that are moving. And I think specifically for certain countries, specific locations that we're at, uh, indigenous communities, mm. um, we're, we're seeing some differences in that. I wanna give you a positive story and maybe whisper to any of my listeners, I have some uh, high level friends at uh, Ikea um, mm. who, who listen to the show. I've worked on projects with them before. But IKEA in India sells solar panels and they sell them to people of color, very impoverished, very poor shopping at oh. IKEA. And they're taking to their shanty huts, to their, to their you know, uh, slum areas, some bad areas. They're taking some of those things back to, to put on the roof and to create energy for internet, for school, for, to do work, you know, things like oh. that. So um, now, we need to see IKEA in the US and IKEA in Europe and other places offer those same type of solutions um, at an affordable price, you know. And I, I don't know what in Germany the 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 rules around renewable energy, especially solar, is you have to be connected to the grid, you have to be able to pay back to the grid and, and exchange back and forth. Uh, that's the way it works with solar in, in Europe. I don't know in the U.S. how it always works about being connected to the grid. If you can have your own little uh, mm -hmm. solar panels on the house and, and how, how all that has worked and evolved over the years. Um, but empowering at the lowest level, those people who, who, who you know, shop at the Ikeas or shop at the local markets to to even understand there's alternatives, there's other options available. Here's yeah. how you have your entry point uh, at a price point that may eventually be affordable to you. Right. Uh, that, that's a great story. Uh, I'd love to see spread around. And, and, and they do a lot of things with the UN and, and the refugee camps and, and things with the UN CHR as well. IKEA does tents and other things, but I, I would love to see some more innovators, sustainable innovators, and some really pioneers go out there and, 
and kind of push our lobbyists, our policymakers, and those local communities to to deliver those services that are needed for everybody. I mean, whether you live in an apartment or a home, you should be able to put a solar panel on your on your balcony or on your roof or have some kind of a a little option. I agree. Which, which also provides you with some resilience in, in times where the grid may fail or uh, where you can't pay your utilities and and the 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 local infrastructure decides to shut your utilities off. That's right. That's yeah. right. And in places like Arizona um, and Hawaii, the the utility has has pushed against that wider proliferation of, of rooftop solar. Um, you know, wanting to sort of maintain control over the system. So it's 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 quite stark. I mean, this is a human rights issue, I think. Um, it is. Yeah, it really is a human rights issue. And um, there's two two last things I oh, want to sure. touch on in the book. Um, and we've kind of already touched on some of them uh, as well, but um, climate change fundamentalism. Mm. How do we how do we end it, or how is it ending? Um, can you tell and what us is it? More? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm, I love it. So, climate change fundamentalism is a term that sort of bubbled up for me um, in the context of advocates who were solely focused on greenhouse gas reductions, um, you know, reducing carbon emissions without focusing on um, the social justice dimensions of this transition. And so they sort of just said, we need more large scale energy or, or whatever, whatever their, their drum is that they're beating, but, we, but we, can't, we can't afford to focus on issues of social justice because we don't have time. So then they become fundamentalist in their in their perspective concerning climate change. And so I have seen that play out in Hawaii. Um, I, I've seen it play out in, in global conversations I'm having around, you know, let's just go big, let's go big, let's go big without thinking about the sort of social and environmental ultimately cost of um, our climate change mitigation strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I think one way to disrupt that narrative is to first call it out, right, to illustrate the ways in which it is limited and that eventually you're going to butt up against issues of social um, unrest or social injustice. Um, and so it's ultimately going to be ineffective and we're still going to have the most vulnerable people, you know, migrating because of climate change and not able to adapt, not able to be resilient in the face of weather events. So it's, it's, it's a bad solution sort of on the merits, but it's a bad solution just in terms of our moral obligations. Um, and so I think we call it out and then we also create alliances. We see some of the major um, environmental organizations like the Sierra Club, like Environmental Defense Fund, like the Natural Resources Defense Council, finally coming around to these ideas that, oh, equity needs to be a part of what we, we do. And unfortunately, they have not trained themselves to understand equity. So they're kind of going into communities now and trying to connect with communities around these issues. But because of the history, because of the ways in which they've burned some of these communities in the past and gone against them on issues of justice, there's still some healing that needs to be done and in repairing those relationships. So, so we're in this we're in this reckoning where um, the reckoning is happening also within the environmental community, and we have the the justice centered folks who are now getting a bigger voice in the environmental space, and they're sort of disrupting this narrative around climate change fundamentalism. But, I love um, that. I love that. So I deal with that a lot in, in many different aspects. There's so too many to, to name uh, veganism, biofuels, mm. bioreactors. Uh, you know, we went, we made a big push push on uh, on that a while ago, and it's come back to bite us because mm. it, it yep. was just a bad idea. Um, yep. um, we need more a uh, systemic approach that addresses all the multi multiple facets of, of environment, and climate, and 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 um, to, to get rid of way, this extremism. It's almost fundamentalism in some respects. It's this blinder view on just one siloed approach for the solution. There is no silver bullet. Uh, I'm sorry, there is no silver bullet. It, it, you need to take a systemic approach and really uh, address all those aspects. It, yeah, there are some positives around it, but to, uh, to leave out so indigenous uh, and, and social justice and, and um, is just, just horrific. 
The last one we did touch upon on credit, but it's really about the u utility reform linchpin. Mm. You want to say a little bit more about that and uh, at, at yeah. all, kind of explain a little bit more on, on what that is and uh, for sure. Our so I would say there are two. Um, I mean, I think every chapter in the book is important, but uh, I would say sort of foundational pieces of this transition are. Um, or key aspects of the transition are, you know, reforming our utility sector and access to finance. We talked a lot about the access to finance piece and the problems with people being able to, you know, get the financing they need to put rooftop solar on or participate in community energy. So that's one thing. On the utility um, reform side, I think we've just got to grapple with what justice looks like in the utility sector. Um, we have created a system that is incentivized to build crap. <laughs> And, and to charge us for it and, uh, you know, whether or not that infrastructure is needed um, and whether or not that's the, the most just path toward this clean energy transition. So they're incentivized to build things, they're incentivized to sell energy, sell electricity, whether or not it's based on a clean grid or a dirty one. And so I think we have to really um, take a hard look at the business model that, you um, that is the current dominant model. And I'm thinking mainly about the investor owned utility model in the United States. Um, we have the public power model, which is you know, more municipally driven. Um, you could argue that a state owned a grid is another public model um, or a cooperatively owned model, which has been problematic in some places, but is another way to kind of think about um, you know, the people owning their own electricity. So, so yeah, that's, I, I think, until we figure out how to properly incentivize investor owned utilities or um, really understand the best business model in general or the best sort of governance model, it's more of a governance model for the utility sector. Um, I think we're still gonna be butting up against uh, some resistance in terms of a just clean energy transition because the IOUs are the ones stopping rooftop solar in this country. They are the ones kind of stopping innovation around communities owning their own energy assets. Um, and we, we've got to deal with them um, if, if we're gonna make sure that this transition allows for the economic justice that I think it pretends. Here's my last hardest question for you. Oh, no. I promise. Yeah, I promise. <laughs> uh, and it's really similar to the WTF, but it is mm. what what does a world that works for everyone look mm. like for you? Wow. Well, you know, it's almost hard to even imagine that, right? Because we're so far from it. Um, it is one where we don't have benefits programs because everyone is on equal footing, right? We don't need, um, I mean, I guess we, we have a, sa a social safety net, but it's not because people are falling, it's because you know, their baseline is, is, is just so much higher. And so that's a world in which every child born into the world um, has the opportunity to, out, to live his or her, their potential right, um, where their zip code doesn't determine life outcomes um, or the race doesn't determine their outcomes or ethnicity or skin color. Um, and it's one where the government um, <clears throat> has provided a substantial foundation for, uh, upon which everyone can thrive. And that's, that's the best future for me. And that means across dimensions, it means in the energy sector, it means, um, you know, health and education, it is, it is, just a place where you know we sprout like trees you know and, and flowers and you can just really shine um and in, in, in living our potential that's beautiful thank you very much the the last three questions i have for you are self uh selfish takeaways for my listeners i want you to kind of give them a sustainable takeaway that has the ability to empower empower them or to get them to look at uh, uh, how they can apply it into their lives or see the world differently. So if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners uh, that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Ooh, wow. You know, you mentioned sustainability and 
I think it's it's a noble goal as well as resilience. These are noble goals. Um, the question, the disruptive question I will ask is, what are we sustaining, right? Are we in a, sustaining a system that is inherently unjust and unequal? And, and what are we um, making more resilient as we move forward? Are we making our, our unequal and inequitable structures more resilient as we, as we harden and prepare for the, what's ahead? So let us be disruptive in how we think about these two concepts that are such a, a big part of the discourse around climate. Um, what are we sustaining and how are we contributing to inequality? And what are we rendering resilient um, as, as we move forward? So I think that's- I, I, I love that. No, okay. That, that <laughs> definitely answers the question. Um, what should young lawyers, innovators in the energy sector, renewable transition uh, be thinking about if they're looking for real ways to make impact? Yeah. Find your allies on the ground. Talk to people who are living it. Um, there are so many community organizations around the world, and I've connected with them, where folks are fighting for breath. They're fighting for life. They're fighting for clean water. Um, and so align yourself with them. Communicate with them because you have such power as an educated person, as someone who understands technology. Um, and you can translate what they are experiencing into your work. Um, or at least it can inform your, your the way you do your work. So this is about stitching together that society that I talked about, right? It's stitching together that um, community through those relationships. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that mm -hmm. you would have loved to know from the start? Keep trusting your instinct keep trusting your intuition. And I have followed it, but it's been scary at times, not knowing if, you know, when I leapt, if the ground was really going to be there, um, but it will be. And, and um, I'm continuing to be on this journey. I'm halfway through my life and I'm so excited about the next half. That's all I have for you today. Mm -hmm. It's been absolutely wonderful. I thank you so much for being on the show. And if there's anything else that you might have left out or you'd like to say, now's your opportunity. Otherwise, I'm going to wish you a wonderful day. Oh, wow. Well, it's just been such a pleasure to be on this call and in this conversation with you. And thank you so much for reading the book and for the care that you with which you read it. Um, and thank you for allowing me to elevate this message of energy justice and revolutionary power. It's You're been a most pleasure. most welcome. You're most welcome. Revolutionary power, a activist guide to energy transitions, a wonderful book. And thank you so much, Alanda. I really appreciate you being on the show and I hope we can have a follow-up very soon. Please take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You Take too. care. Bye -bye.